thanks for um, inviting me to speak here tonight. It's really great to have a chance to think about questions of justice in the context of climate change. It's something that I've been working on for a number of years. Um, as you can possibly tell from my accent, I'm not, um, not Australian, but I have done a lot of work on climate justice in the context of the UK, also in Hong Kong, and increasingly in Australia. So what I would hope to do over the next 15, 20 minutes or so is to draw out some of that research and really pose some questions for how we might think about or how we might understand questions around climate justice. I think it's a really topical issue at the moment for a number of reasons, and one of those really strongly relates to the, to the Paris Climate Summit that happened last year. I think prior to that point, climate justice was a, was a topic of conversation, was something that was very much talked about in the NGO or activist arena, but it hadn't really made it into the mainstream, perhaps. And I think the Paris Climate, climate Summit and the run-up to that summit really made the question of justice in the context of climate change a much more mainstream issue. And I think that's why it's important that we do, um, do talk about those issues and questions now. I think it's also important because climate justice is now included in the preamble to the Paris Climate Summit. So there's a really clear, explicit recognition of vulnerable groups, of actually having to take action on the question of justice in the context of climate change. And that's something that, again, is quite new and quite important. And I think thinking about how we go forward from that in terms of taking action, um, it becomes quite an important, uh, important perspective. But I think also if we go outside the formal negotiating space, this topic of climate justice is increasingly important in other arenas and other spaces. So I was recently doing some field work with climate justice activists in Singapore. And one of the examples that they pointed to was the company Ben & Jerry's, so the ice cream maker. They were talking about how Ben & Jerry's has actually had a very long and active climate justice campaign. And I was quite surprised because I hadn't, hadn't heard about this at all. But I think it's a real indication of how these questions are actually going beyond just the government sphere, going beyond just the kind of activist sphere, and how they're actually becoming much more mainstream and therefore things that we actually have to be able to, um, to think about and to address. And so then the, the question becomes, well, why is climate change an issue for justice? And I've got a number of responses to that that I'll talk through over the next 15 minutes or so. But fundamentally, it's really because those who are most affected by the impact of climate change are, th are those people who haven't caused climate change. It's a really fundamental relationship. And that's really why when we think about equity, we think about ethics, we think about justice, that's really why it becomes very important. But of course, that's a very kind of baseline or baseline definition. And what I'd like to do is just to explore that with you in a bit more detail. And so to give you a sense just where of my perspective and where I'm coming from, um, I've done a lot of research starting in the field of thinking about environmental justice and increasingly moving into questions around energy justice and climate justice. Very much with that, working with um, activist organisations, so NGO groups, but increasingly thinking about what that might mean in other types of spaces. So thinking about what does climate justice mean in the context of cities. And I think there's some really clear parallels that we can draw here, perhaps in discussion about, about Sydney and Sydney's response to climate change as, as an urban area. Thinking about what that might mean in the context of communities, so community groups. How do questions of justice get taken on board in community energy schemes, for example? But also reflecting back on my own role as an academic and thinking about the role of universities in that context as well. What could and should universities be doing? I just finished a research project very much looking at my own institution and trying to understand what our collective responsibilities should actually be. And there are three key guiding questions then that I'd like to spend the rest of my time talking about or, or thinking about with you. And the first of this is really around how are the impacts or the burdens of climate change being distributed around the world? That's one element of climate justice that's really important, I think, thinking about this differential vulnerability, this uneven distribution. The second question, which I think is probably the more politically difficult one to solve, is who is actually responsible for addressing climate change? If we are thinking about questions of justice, questions of equity, responsibility surely comes hand in hand with that. And I think it's something that is interesting to explore in that, in that context. And finally, to think about how do we actually go about making decisions or taking action on climate change? What kinds of things could we and should we be doing? And how might, how might it change our action if we really position that with a very ethical or justice lens to that? So those are the three questions that I want to, want to spend some time thinking about and talking about.
So as I suggested in the introduction, one of the reasons why, or the key reason why climate change is really an issue for justice is because the burdens or the impacts of climate change, some of which Leslie referred to, are very unevenly distributed around the world. So those types of impacts around um, extreme weather, for example, around flooding, food insecurity, um, hot days, um, temperature rises, all of those are really unevenly distributed around the world. So a report just released last week by the University of East Anglia in the UK suggested that the tropical regions are the ones that are most likely to, affect, um, to be affected by the impacts of heat waves because of their very, um, their very uneven vulnerability to extreme weather events. But I think we can think about this in a variety of ways and think about well, what makes places or people particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And there are three key ways of thinking about these kind of differential vulnerability um, and di differential impacts. One of those is around the issue of space. So I'm a, I'm a geographer. I get very excited about questions of space and scale. So it's always good to be able to talk about space in these types of events. One of which, the second of which is around population. So differences within population groups. And the third of those impacts is around time. So how do we account for current and future generations? So turning firstly to think about space then, geographical location is a very clear indicator for um, who will be most affected by the impacts of climate change. We can think about this basically on a kind of global north, global south level in terms of recognising that those countries and those people located in countries of the global south generally are going to be much more affected by the impacts of climate change, which again is an issue for justice because these aren't the people that have caused the problem of climate change. There's a number of distinctions we can make here between different types of population groups. One that I think gets talked about a lot is those people in living in um, um, low-lying islands who are likely to face forced resettlement or environmental migration in the future. So we can think about this as being a very clearly uneven distribution across space in relation to facing the impacts of climate change. How we deal with issues around forced resettlement or environmental migration in the future becomes a very clearly political issue. And thinking about how countries such as Australia and New Zealand and their relationship with the Pacific Islands, how are we actually gonna try and tackle those issues or deal with those issues in the future? The second issue that I think perhaps is, is, not so, is not so obvious or perhaps not so evident from the outset is it's about differences across different population groups. So for example, those people living in poverty are much more likely to be impacted by the effects of climate change, both in the global north but also in the global south. People living below um, you know, $1 or $2 a day threshold are really unlikely to be able to afford air conditioning in the future. So if we think about a rising global temperature, um, a rising number of heat waves, then thinking about how people can actually respond or adapt to that becomes really, really problematic. There are also a certain parts of the population that are much more likely to face the impacts of climate change, whether that's in um, physical or biological terms, or whether that's in more cultural or social terms. So for example, the elderly or the very young are those who are most vulnerable to the impacts of heat waves. So the Paris heat wave in 2000 and, um, 2003, the majority of people who died from that were people who were, who were elderly or who were very young. There was a kind of biological tendency to be much more affected by, by heat waves. But there's also a set of kind of cultural debates here around people who may be isolated, who may not, particularly who may not have English as a first language if you're living in Australia. There's a sense of um, being culturally or socially isolated also makes you much more vulnerable to the impact of things such as heat waves. So there's lots of research that's been done that's really looked at the kind of the role of social networks and understanding how, you know, being able to talk to your neighbours, being able to look after your neighbours, being able to work within your community actually makes you much more resilient to the, to the um, effects of heat waves. Women particularly are another really vulnerable group and we can talk about that on a number of different levels. So thinking, thinking through the kind of global north global south divide, women in the global south particularly are much more likely to be vulnerable to the impacts of heat waves, partly because of their cultural role in the household, partly because of biological, um, biological issues. But that's also true in Australia as well. So recent research that one of my students was doing was around looking at the, gender, um, the gendered impacts of climate change in the context of Sydney and really recognising that that's also an issue for, for places such as Australia. And it raises a whole set of issues for how we actually respond to that in policy terms. How do we actually address issues of gender in the context of climate change? And so the third issue then in terms of thinking about distributions is those across time. And I think this is probably one of the most difficult ones to tackle. It's much less, 
much less concrete, I suppose, much more intangible, but how do we actually account for future populations? How do we actually take action ourselves? And how do we think that we can potentially speak for future generations? So we think about principles of democracy, for example. Can we actually apply the same principles that we, that we think about now? Is, is that actually relevant for future generations? How can we actually ensure that their voices are being heard? What types of mechanisms can we actually put into place? But I think we'd all agree that actually if we don't do something now, if we don't act for those future generations, that in itself becomes a fundamental injustice. So it's, it's, it's about thinking through ways of actually trying to act on those, on those questions. And I think making a direct correlation back to the Paris summit, some of the action that was, that was agreed there, of course, one of the burdens becomes around financing. So who is actually going to pay for, the, for these questions around climate change? Um, costs of adaptation are likely to be huge. So a World Bank report that was released last week suggested that it's going to cost in the region of $158 trillion to manage climate-related disasters in the future. That will likely affect 1.3 billion people across the world. So these are not small numbers. Who's actually going to pay that $158 trillion? How are we actually going to raise that amount of financing throughout the world to actually deal with those climate-related um, disasters? So that's one question I think that we need to... We need to recognise, and it's been partly addressed through the Paris Climate Summit, but I think there is more work to be done there. So the second question then, I think, is the one that's probably the most politically controversial, and I think is the one that always causes debate, in terms of thinking about who is responsible for addressing climate change. And it's something that's an incredibly contested issue. And most often in the past, it's taken place at the international level. So discussions about how we allocate responsibilities have taken place at the national level as part of these intergovernmental negotiations. So the Paris Climate Summit is one example of that. And it's been very much a case of trying to allocate responsibilities to particular nation states based on their past emissions. So trying to make the case that the United States should play a bigger role in addressing climate change because of its past emissions behaviour. But I think if we do that, then what we do is we, we really focus on the nation state as being the kind of focal point of action. And that's helpful to a certain degree. But I think we also need to recognise there are a whole range of other actors who are also responsible for climate change. And if we focus all of our attention only on nation states, we kind of ignore everything else that's happening. And I think the danger is also, as, as we've seen in what the past, so COP21, 21 years of climate summits, relying only on national governments to allocate responsibilities hasn't really got us all of that far in, until we reached Paris, the Paris summit last year. So there's a real sense then of trying to understand, well, how do we actually allocate responsibility for climate change? And I'm sure that if I were to ask you to do a straw poll now and to say, well, you know, how many of you think it should be allocated on the basis of past emissions? Should we actually think about what countries have done in the past and say, well, therefore, because of, because of your industrial activity in the past, you should therefore now be responsible for climate change now? Should we actually focus on current emissions, really looking at the state of play now, recognising that perhaps what happened in the past was something that people didn't know about. There was a sense of ignorance about knowing what climate change was and how it was happening. And actually, we can't claim that now. So maybe we should focus on what's happening currently. Or is it actually a case of looking towards the future, recognising that some countries are likely to make a much bigger future contribution to the issue of climate change? So should we actually focus on what's likely to happen in the future rather than focusing on what's happening now? And I'm sure that if I was to do a straw poll with you now, there'd be very divided responses in terms of thinking about how do we actually allocate that responsibility. And it's something that I always like to do with my, with my um, postgraduate students to really get a debate going in terms of thinking about how do we actually allocate this responsibility. In a sense here in terms of, I suppose, thinking through on what type of principles we actually allocate that on. So one way of thinking about this is the kind of this idea of the polluter pays principle, whereby those people who cause the problem should actually therefore address it. Another way in the way that's been adopted by the, um, the UN climate um, negotiations is this idea of common but differentiated responsibility, whereby those people who are more capable to act are, are those people who should actually be taking action on climate change. So hopefully then what you'll see, there's a number of different configurations for how we might think about allocating responsibility.
But I think we can then also turn that around and think about that in the context of ourselves and in our individual actions. So um, I'm not sure how many of you in the room might have calculated your own individual carbon footprints at some point in time and tried to look at your own transport behaviour, your own, um, you know, your, your, how you choose to, um, to buy food, where you choose to travel, all of those kinds of things. And I think increasing, increasingly, we need to actually recognise our own individual contributions to how they actually contribute to the overall global picture around climate change. Although I think there is a danger that that really plays into these kind of neoliberal logics of individualisation, which kind of takes the pressure off government, takes the pressure off other actors. There is a real sense of actually how do we balance that individual responsibility with thinking about what government should be doing or what private sector corporations should be doing. And there is also another set of debates there around carbon footprinting as a kind of mechanism in terms of it tends to spread the responsibility equally among individuals. And the research that I've done has really suggested that actually if we spread that equally, people live very, types, very different types of lifestyles. That kind of assumes that everyone consumes the same amount of carbon, can actually reduce their carbon footprint by 10%, by 15%, for example. It doesn't actually take into account that some people are living incredibly high carbon lifestyles, some are living incredibly low carbon lifestyles. And, then, and this assumption of everyone taking individual action can be quite problematic in that regard. <coughs> And so I think then there is a real balance in relation to questions around responsibility. Who do we actually allocate that to? What type of configuration? How much of that is placed on individual action? How much of that is placed on, the, on, placed on governments? How much of that is placed on private sector corporations? And I think then the role of the government in terms of enabling or disa disabling that kind of action becomes really critical. And so the final point then I think is around how do we actually take action on climate change? If we have these questions of climate justice or we have these questions of equity at the top of our mind, how do we actually go about taking action and what types of things should we be doing in that context? And part of that then is around how we actually make decisions, which again becomes, a, becomes naturally quite a political issue. So questions around who's actually able to become involved in decision making around climate change? Whose voices are actually heard? How much do NGO voices get heard at climate summits, for example? Or how much, how much um, do private corporations actually dominate discussions? And I think then those types of questions about how policy is being made and how decisions are being taken have clear reflections on action. So it's not just about this question of communicating science or actually just giving people information. It's actually having a genuine, <coughs> genuine mechanism to having your voice heard. And I think one of the really clear things or really positive things that came out of the Paris Climate Summit was around, it was seen to be much more open than previous summits had been in terms of enabling different voices to, to, to be heard, in terms of really recognising a diversity of, 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 um, of different organisations to actually become involved. And I think in Australia, the Climate Council is also a really good example of that in terms of actually trying to draw people in have, and en enable a genuine dialogue around questions of climate change. And so then the role of national governments becomes really critical in terms of, particularly in terms of ratifying the Paris summit, in terms of taking action on the Paris summit. And there's definitely potential, um, you know, potential for the Australian government to do more in this context. But to end on a perhaps a more hopeful note, there's also the recognition there's a whole number of actors out there who can actually act on climate change. And I think this does give us a bit more of a space for hope. So recognising there's a whole diversity of climate change responses happening that go beyond the state. We're not just relying on the government for action here, essentially. And I think if we frame it in that way, we can actually see there's, there's more spaces to operate than, than perhaps we might um, otherwise think. So just a couple of recent examples. I'm not sure how many of you took part in the recent um, People's Climate March in Sydney in November last year. Probably a lot of you in the room took part in that. And there's a real recognition that having that kind of collective voice, that kind of collective action, um, has, I suppose, raises a kind of sense, of sense around empowerment. So although it wasn't necessarily directly influencing policy in that sense, there's a real sense of coming together, having a collective voice on climate change. is something that can actually be quite powerful. And another example is a community energy scheme that I'm very familiar with in the UK, which is in South London, a very deprived part of South London. And it's done incredible work at drawing together the agendas around poverty, agendas around energy use, um, thinking through climate change, to really develop a community owned um, solar PV panels that are really trying to create well-being within the community as well as addressing the wider challenge of climate change.
So I think there are real opportunities there in thinking through how we actually draw together agendas around poverty, energy, climate change to actually take action for the future. And so just as a kind of a closing, a closing note really, um, I've, I've got a couple of quotes and some recent interviews I was doing with climate justice activists in Hong Kong and Singapore in terms of what they think would actually work on this, on this issue. And there's a couple of, couple of reflections here. One is around positive messaging and around this idea of empowerment. So one person said to me, I hate saying I'm a movement against climate change because it's a double negative. I'm defining myself as opposed to something else. I'd rather say I'm fighting for climate justice. And there's a real sense there of kind of positive messaging and hope coming out from that. And the second person talked about this idea of the emotional connection with climate change. And her, her voice was really saying, well, you have to really touch the pain point but it cannot be so painful that you can't do anything. It should be able to trigger you to say, hey, now I can do something about this. And there was, a, again, a real sense of actually this emotional connection and not feeling so disempowered that you actually can't act. So I think then just by, just by way of closing, I think we do need a kind of socially and politically differentiated response to climate change rather than one universal response to climate change across the board. And I think what we also need to recognise is that there are spaces for radical action, for radical political action. But there's also spaces for hope in terms of perhaps the more mundane, everyday political practices that we all engage in. I think if we can think about that in the context of justice, it might give us perhaps a, a more hopeful way forward. So thank you.